I'm continuing reading Race in the City, a compilation of essays that were edited by Henry Lewis Taylor, Jr. This book was published in 1993. And we are now on Chapter 10, which was written by Robert A. Burnham. It's entitled, The Mayor's Friendly Relations Committee, Cultural Pluralism and the Struggle for Black Advancement. In the aftermath of the Detroit race riot of 1943, cities and states across the country rushed to form race relations or intergroup relations committees for the purpose of reducing interracial hostilities. Though this was a national phenomenon of some significance, it has been little studied by scholars. Those who have considered the subject tend to address it in two ways. First, they assess the goals and activities of the committees that were formed in the 1940s from the perspective of the civil rights movement of the 1960s. This has led to interpretations that criticize these committees for failing to take militant action toward ending discrimination against blacks and improving the conditions under which they lived. The second approach sees the establishment of these committees as a response to interracial tension caused by the Second World War. According to this argument, the war acted as a causative factor, in part by dramatizing fundamental contradictions between American ideals and American social realities. Nothing indicated this better than the fact that the United States fought the war in the name of democracy but use segregated troops to do so. Similarly, the prevalence of employment discrimination in war industries highlighted the unequal social status of blacks. Moreover, those who hold this view point out the mass migration of Southern blacks to Western and Northern cities during the war led to more frequent contact between whites and blacks in those cities and placed great strain on urban resources. This development supposedly precipitated interracial tension and violence, violence, which in turn led contemporaries to establish race relations and intergroup relations committees. Though domestic tension during the war provided an impetus for forming these committees, an examination of one of them, the Mayor's Friendly Relations Committee, or the MFRC of Cincinnati, suggests that it was a product of the contemporary tendency to see society as divided into various racial, religious, and ethnic groups, each possessing its own culture, which had a deterministic effect on the individual members of the group. This pluralistic vision yielded, among other things, a broad intercultural understanding movement between 1915 and 1954 that aimed to promote tolerance for cultural group diversity within American society. As part of that movement, the MFRC functioned first and foremost to minimize tension between groups, tension that stemmed from racial, religious, and ethnic prejudice in hopes of preventing violent outbreaks. This goal required that the committee address the issues of prejudice and discrimination as the underlying causes of group conflict. Although blacks were the main targets of prejudice and discrimination, the pluralistic vision dictated that the MFRC consider the problems of all groups and show partiality to none. Thus, in its early years, the MFRC self-consciously avoided taking an advocacy role for the rights of blacks or any other single racial, religious, or ethnic group. Nonetheless, as an official arm of the city government charged with reducing intergroup tension and promoting intergroup harmony as matters of public policy, the MFRC helped provide a climate in which Cincinnati blacks could pursue their struggle for civil rights. Indeed, the initiative for forming the MFRC 
came from the city's black leaders who believed that improving intergroup relations would benefit the members of their race. In the wake of the Detroit race riot, a delegation of blacks met with Republican Mayor James G. Stewart on July 8, 1943, to discuss measures to, quote, lessen any likelihood of similar trouble in Cincinnati, end quote. The delegation included Harold Snell, executive director of the local NAACP, Sadie Samuels, an elementary school teacher and NAACP member, William Loveless, an adult probation officer for the Common Pleas Court and NAACP member, and Arnold B. Walker, executive director of the Cincinnati Community Chess Division of Negro Welfare. They suggested that the mayor arrange a meeting with newspapers, church leaders, union leadership, educational directors of radio stations, chamber of commerce officials, OCD officials, etc., end quote, and select a representative cross-section of those attending to sit on a Citizens Committee on Unity. They also considered a cru it crucial for this committee to be independent politically so it could demand protections for the minorities. The mayor thought that the idea of forming such a committee was a good suggestion, and he said he would name a small group of civic leaders to implement it. Mayor Stewart's slow response to the concerns of black leaders suggested, however, suggested that he felt no great sense of urgency. After allowing three months to lapse, he finally held a meeting for the purpose of forming an intergroup relations committee on October 7, 1943. This meeting was attended by representatives of the Division of Negro Welfare, B'nai B'rith, the Council of Churches, the Public Recreation Commission, the CIO, Catholic Charities, the Chamber of Commerce, and the Frontier, Frontiers Club, a black men's club consisting of businessmen and professionals devoted to community service. All those who spoke at the meeting, including the mayor, placed their aims in the context of the war effort by claiming that they sought to make democratic ideals function at home as well as abroad. At the same time, there was general agreement that the proposed committee should be made permanent. Thus, while wartime concerns and conditions played a significant role in the establishment of the MFRC, from the outset, Cincinnati leaders envisioned a committee that would continue to function after the war's end an indication that they did not see their action as merely a response to wartime problems. Moreover, the conferees showed their inclination to think in pluralistic terms by suggesting that the committee should go even further than dealing with interracial problems and accept the problems of religious, economic, and other social groups. It was also agreed that the mayor should be responsible for appointing the members of the committee and for presenting the entire plan to the city council to get its official backing. The Cincinnati City Council passed a resolution authorizing the creation of the committee on November 17, 1943. The resolution declared, quote, whereas America is made up of many diverse groups, with varying viewpoints and different beliefs, the hope of both the present and future of our Republic is that we shall work together in harmony and without prejudice, hate, or intolerance, end quote. As for Cincinnati, the resolution expressed the belief that conflicting problems between various groups could be solved upon the basis of friendship rather than hostility. To achieve this, the resolution authorized the mayor to appoint the committee to be known as the Friendly Relations Committee, representing the various racial, industrial, religious, and other groups for the purpose of studying the problems connected with the promotion of harmony and tolerance 
and for working out community problems and by acting as an advisory committee for their solutions. The resolution was significant because first it gave the MFRC official status and thus indication with the city government, identification with the city government. Second, it clearly asserted a pluralistic view by report repeatedly referring to society as being divided into groups and by basing the committee's structure and function on that same notion. And finally, by limiting the services of the MFRC to that of an advisory committee and to the study of problems, the resolution also limited its role. Without any enforcement powers, the MFRC had to rely on its ability to persuade people to change their prejudiced views and discriminatory practices. The committee was to be composed of 100 members, although the number sometimes fluctuated slightly due to resignations and new appointments. Members sat as representatives from various civic and social clubs, religious denominations, and organizations social agencies, black organization, newspapers and radio stations, labor organizations, business and industry, the public schools and colleges and universities. By forming a relatively large committee and basing appointments on organizational affiliation, those active in the planning of the MFRC hope to achieve broad representation in order to reach the essential roots of the committee, community and to ensure the participation of all groups. The appointments to the MFRC also indicated a desire to recruit people of some stature as members of normally headed and organizations or institutions they represented. This served to increase the rate of turnover on the committee because each time a representative a represented organization elected a new president or chairperson, that person usually replaced his or her pre predecessor as a member of the MFRC. Between 1943 and 1946, 167 people were appointed to the committee. 49 were women, at least 10 were blacks, and at least 9 were Jews. As for the occupational makeup of the committee, social workers, educators, clergymen, doctors, lawyers, and businessmen predominated. The committee first met on December 23, 1943, and unsurprisingly issued a statement announcing that it would not function as a black advocacy group. We are not working for the welfare of any one group, declared the committee, but are fostering improvements in conditions, interrelations, and interplay of personalities which, which will safeguard the rights of all citizens. And the MFRC did engage in various types of intergroup relations activities. In 1945, for instance, it helped with the resettlement of Cincinnati in Cincinnati of Japanese Americans who had been victimized by the federal government's wartime policies. The MFRC also worked to promote religious tolerance by participating in and sponsoring events designed to bring people with different religious backgrounds together. But the committee spent most of its time on the problems that divided whites and blacks. Those problems warranted, warranted close attention, not only because they were most obvious and pervasive, but also because they seemed most likely to spark racial violence. The kind of crisis the infant MFRC feared developed on the night of June 5, 1944, when a group of between 50 to 100 men and boys stoned a Mount Adams home occupied by two black families who had moved into the downstairs apartment that day. The crowd threw hundreds of rocks and stones, which destroyed all the doors and windows and tore out the fittings of the first floor stovepipe. The two black families reportedly 
the first Negro residents on the street were persuaded by the police to spend the night elsewhere as a safety precaution. And I've got documentation for that. I will add it to the comments. The situation heated up again three days later as several hundred people staged a demonstration outside the Mount Adams home of Mrs. Cortland Bennett, a white woman who had publicly criticized the participants in the house stoning. According to Bennett's 14-year-old daughter, the police did nothing to disperse the demonstrators or, ve or vented their anger by hanging an effigy of her mother. Police Lieutenant Chester Sw Swillinger, however, claimed that the patrolman at the scene had responded with caution for fear of provoking further hostilities. The Mount Adams incident caught the MFRC and the police unprepared. The MFRC took essentially no action on either incident, which indicated not a lack of concern, but the inability of a rather large and cumbersome committee, which met only once a month, to deal with emergency situations that arose without warning. The events in Mount Adams put the MFRC in an unenviable position, but simultaneously exposing its weaknesses and emphasizing the need for action. The MFRC experienced pressure from the city's safety director, Gordon Schurer, who came before the executive board on July 13, 1944, to urge its members to step up their efforts. For his part, Schur said he had taken all steps possible to quell disturbances that may arise by making conne connections with the state guard and the federal protective service and by ordering patrolmen to lean over backwards to avoid prejudice. Sure, in a speech delivered before the Civic Club on September 19, 1944, recognized the racial issue as an old problem that never has been handled because white people had ignored it. In an effort to address the problem, Schur established a race relations detail within the city police department during the winter of 1945. The race relations detail was to be called upon to deal specifically with race-related disturbances. Lieutenant Stanley R. Schrotel, a white officer who would become chief of police in 1951, headed this special unit, which also included one white officer, Henry Sandman, and one black officer, Robert Wilson. The fact that the race relations detail and the MFRC shared office space in City Hall brought them in almost daily contact with each other and ensured a close working relationship. The MFRC also took action that would make it more responsive, a, a more responsive body by hiring Marshall Bragdon in the summer of 1945 to serve as executive secretary of the committee. Bragdon, a native of Minneapolis and a graduate of Wesleyan University, came to Cincinnati from Springfield, Massachusetts, where he had been the literary critic for the Springfield Republican. He was brought to the attention of the MFRC, however, through his writings and lectures on behalf of the so-called Springfield Plan, an educational program initiated in 1939 by the Springfield Public Schools that enlisted the support of the entire community for the purpose of diminishing group antagonism and promoting democratic citizenship. As a full-time employee of the MFRC, Bragdon's position enabled and required him to keep up on the issues and events relevant to the functions of the committee on a day-to-day -day basis, as well as to plan, direct, and help carry out its activities. With Bragdon in office, the MFRC faced another potential racial crisis in 1946. On August 19, 1946, four black men stopped a young white couple who were driving through Cincinnati's predominantly black West End en route to Price Hill. 
a white neighborhood, and allegedly raped the woman while holding her escort at gunpoint. Cincinnati whites, especially those living in Price Hill, reacted to the incident with outrage, claiming that his own daughter had been threatened by Negroes, the Price Hill attorney, Salmon John Scan Scanlon, demanded the right to carry arms. The Eastern Hills Lions, a Price Hill club, offered the services of its members to help police, help police protect our women folk. That's a quote. With the specter of vigilantism, I'm sure I'm pronouncing that incorrectly, presenting itself, the Price Hill Civic Club called for a mass meeting to be held on August 22nd. The MFRC acted to head off the threat of violence surrounding the meeting by making personal contact with ministers, civic leaders, and others who could strike a note of common sense and moderation. On the day of the meeting, the MFRC also met to discuss emergency strategy and could report that its contact people had already revised the situation so that the Price Hill meeting was unlikely to take a racial turn. This assessment pro proved correct. Those who attended the meeting directed their scorn less against blacks than against city officials and police for failing to provide pro protection at the West End approaches to Price Hill. To further direct attention away from the race issue, the MFRC issued a statement to the press asking Cincinnatians to refrain from blaming an entire neighborhood or racial group for individual misdeeds. That the committee felt the need to encourage citizens not to associate with individual criminal behavior with cultural group affiliation attested to their proclivity to see individual behavior as culturally determined. The statement also urged citizens to look beyond the crime of rape and see the need to aid West End Blacks to live under, quote, unquote, deplorable conditions which breed poverty, disease, despair, and crime. The prompt response of the MFRC, however, was only part of a concerted effort to diffuse racial tension and reduce the possibility of violence. The acting city manager, John Ellis, released statistics on rape that showed that the problem was not racial in nature nor confined to the West End. Gordon Shearer, now a member of the city council, and Bleeker Marquette, executive secretary of the Better Housing League, also attempted to play down the race issue by publicly announcing their belief that slum conditions in the West End fostered crime. Black organizations issued a joint statement offering their complete cooperation to those seeking to apprehend the criminals and bring them to justice. The effectiveness of these statements may be judged by the fact that the violence many feared never materialized. But whether or not these efforts proved the deciding factor, they did win praise from the Ohio State News, a Columbus-based black newspaper, which reported that both white and black community leaders in Cincinnati responded to the dire threat threats against the community's Negroes by taking action on an unprecedented scale. After the crisis had subsided, the MFRC began to examine the factors that tended to fan racial flames and to seek preventative measures. The committee concluded that the local press and radio heightened tensions by their injudicious and even hysterical reports of the crime. Acting on this view, Marshall Bragdon and Judge Robert Gorman, who sat on the MFRC executive board, 
arranged a meeting in mid-September with the publishers Robert Ferber of the Cincinnati Enquirer and Holbert Taft of the Cincinnati Times Star. When confronted with the issue, both Ferger and Taft agreed that the race label was an integral part of the story, and therefore appropriate. Taft did, however, express his disapproval of the repeated use of the word Negro in the reports and pledged to see that it did not happen in the future. Ferger gave his assurance that similar crimes would be reported sympathetically, quote unquote. In addition to gaining these concessions from Taft and Ferger, the MFRC entertained its own plan for countering racially inflammatory reporting. It proposed to secure advance support from highly influential and key individuals who would be ready on the shortest notice to publish a statement counseling moderation, orderly democratic pro procedures, and fair play. While the West End rape proved the most threatening immediate problem the MFRC had to face in its early years, the committee was constantly called upon to address other racial incidents. Of these charges of brutality and other forms of abuse against blacks by Cincinnati policemen received the most public attention. This issue came up at an MFRC board meeting in April 18, 1946, when board members Arnold B. Walker suggested that policemen should be provided with training in minority problems and the techniques you needed to meet them. In addition, he recommended that district officers call on the race relations detail with, great, with greater frequency. Responding to Walker, the city safety director, Oris Hamilton, who also sat on the MFRC board, voiced his reluctance to institute race relations training for fear that the cop on the beat might come to consider himself an expert and try to deal with situations he could not handle. Hamilton also claimed that Walker was wrong in suggesting the police were not referring racial matters to the race relations detail. Due to many instances of violent and brutal treatment, however, the local NAACP declared war on police brutality in August 1946. By issuing a public statement charging Cincinnati law enforcers with anti-Negro attitudes, quote unquote, according to the statement, the police trial board, a body within the police department that heard complaints against officers, rarely returned judgments of guilty. Does that sound like 1920, 2019, what's going on today? Doesn't it? Yeah. No guilty judgments against police. Mm -hmm. The NAACP recommended public trials for officers, colored representation on the police trial board, and race relations training for police. On December 31, 1946, the city manager, Wilbur N. Kellogg, further inflamed the sense of injustice felt by blacks by announcing that he found no reason to censure the two detectives involved in the case of Nathan Wright. And there's a footnote, because I don't remember who Nathan Wright is. Maybe I read it and I don't remember. Nathan Wright, footnote 39. In late November, oh, here's the story. In late November, Wright, a black ministerial student who had been stopped for questioning by the two detectives, and afterward he accused them of using abusive and threatening language toward him. Wright's case came before the City Council Law Committee on January 6, 1947, and two witnesses testified that the detectives did not use abusive 
or threatening language in their questioning. The city manager who attended the hearing said that none of the testimony had persuaded him to change his original decision not to take action against the detectives. In its January 1947 board minutes, the MFRC referred to the Wright case as our most publicized headache. This short phrase conveyed much about the attitude of the committee. Though the MFRC hoped to see an end to police misconduct and supported race relations training of officers, it thought that the publicity surrounding the Wright case contributed to race racial tension and therefore represented another obstacle to the promotion of tolerance among groups. So it sounds like they just want to cover stuff over. They just want to make it go away. This view predominated on the MFRC not only in response to the right case, but in response to any divisive issue confronting the committee, which normally preferred to work quietly behind the scenes. Nonetheless, the MFRC believed that some positive signs emerged out of the right case. The case asserted the MFRC helped develop better cooperation and consultation between police and leading citizens within the black community, and it led safety director Hamilton to promise that in the future, police training would include information on human relations. At best, the optimism of the MFRC proved premature. Many of the same issues involved in the Wright case resurfaced with the case of Haney Bradley, a black man who was beaten by two police and charged with disorderly conduct in June 1947. Judge William D. Alexander, who heard Bradley's case, dismissed the disorderly conduct charge and asserted that, quote, there was no cause for the officers to beat this defendant, unquote. Despite the ruling of the court, Safety Director Hamilton announced in August that the police department hearing on the Bradley case led him to conclude that there was no reason to take disciplinary action against the officers. Footnote. Hamilton's announcement prompted disgruntled representatives of the Council of Churches, the NAACP, the Women's City Club, the Jewish Community Council, and the West End Civic League to send a joint letter to the City Council, which planned to review Bradley's case. The letter criticized police procedure on the grounds that the hearing was held in secret, quote unquote, and that Bradley's counsel and other interested persons were not permitted to attend. In addition, it charged safety director Hamilton and the chief of police with acting primarily to protect the officers while showing little interest in social attitudes and tensions in the community. That was a quote with a footnote. The NFRC decided not to sign the letter though encouraged to do so by executive board member Richard Bluestein, who lent his signature as a representative of the Jewish Community Council. The MFRC board minutes did not state the reason for not endorsing the letter, but the decision attested to the committee's disposition to avoid taking a, def a definite stand in the interest of impartiality. In this case, however, Bluestein urged the MFRC to take some action which prompted Marshall Bragdon to suggest providing instruction in race relations for the rookie officers then in training. As a result, the MFRC brought in the New York University psycho psychology professor Howard Lane 
who had worked with the Detroit Police Department to give a talk to the young officers in early October. Lane's presentation, however, was a one-time event, thus leaving unresolved the question of instituting race relations training as a regular part of police instruction. The City Council reviewed the Bradley case in November and cleared the two policemen of brutality charges, but it also called for police for public hearings of citizen complaints against officers, conferences between the police and the black community, and race relations training. But it also called for public hearings of citizen complaints against officer, officers or conferences between the police and the black community and race relations training. The NFRC expressed its willingness to help implement the conferences and the training, quote, if called upon, unquote to do so, thus leaving the initiative to the police department. <laughs> In September 1948, however, approximately eight months after the city council hearing, the MFRC lamented the fact that the police had taken no action toward beginning neither the conferences, either the conferences or the training. Footnote. The lack of effort on the part of the police department should perhaps not have been surprising given the evidence of racism among some of its upper echelons. For instance, during the Bradley hearing, it was discovered that Assistant Police Chief William C. Adams had hung on his office wall a cartoon that depicted, quote, the body of a gorilla and the head of a Negro man, unquote, and carried the caption, quote, Usson's brutalized, end quote, footnote. I'm going to find his picture. Police Chief William C. Adams. I'm going to find his picture. I'm going to put it in the comments. Police brutality represented only one manifestation of the prejudice and discrimination that permeated Cincinnati society. In Cincinnati, no hospitals would provide convalescent care for blacks or accept them into nurses' training programs. Neither the Cincinnati Conservatory of Music nor the local carpenters or bricklayers unions admitted blacks. Footnote. Restrictive covenants effectively prevented blacks from living in certain areas. In addition, blacks were discriminated against at public pools, skating rinks, the Coney Island amusement park, and restaurants. Footnote. And I'm going to find a restrictive covenant because I'm not seeing anything here. A restrictive covenant that stated that no Others, others, quote unquote, than whites uh, could live in a property that the property owner was not allowed to sell their property to anyone other than whites in that community. Restrictive covenants. I'll get one of those for you. In October 1945, some Cincinnati blacks and whites set out to change these conditions by forming the Citizens Committee for Human Rights, or the CCHR, which became a Congress of Racial Equality, or CORE, C-O-R-E, affiliate. The CCHR challenged discriminatory policies directly by sending its members out in interracial groups to eat in the major downtown restaurants. Like Woolworths. By December 1945, blacks were eating at over 10 such restaurants on a regular basis, 
While it appears that this visitation campaign met with few problems, at most establishments, the manager of the Mills restaurant proved hostile to change. He tried to discourage black customers by, quote, embarrassing them and by openly predicting trouble from white patrons, unquote, footnote. Believing that the manager was attempting to incite racial conflict, Arnold B. Walker brought the matter before the MFRC Executive Board on November 15, 1945, asking for clarification of the perm permissible role of the police race relations detail in such situations. Lieutenant Schrotel, the head of the detail, asserted that the police had, quote, virtually no power except where the law had actually been violated. Oh, I've heard that before. End quote footnote. The manager of Mills did not deny black service, which would have been a violation of the Ohio law, but tried to intimidate them into going elsewhere. Mayor Stewart, who was present at the meeting, said that although he regretted prejudice and discrimination, such problems could not be reached by law, but by gradual education of public opinion. Indeed, the law proved ineffective because juries would not convict those charged with discrimination. For instance, a Cincinnati jury deliberated a full five minutes, quote unquote, before acquitting Happy Watson a waitress employed by Grater's Ice Cream Store on charges that she refused service to several blacks in July 1946. Moreover, no Cincinnatian had ever been convicted under the law, though numerous cases had been tried. I wonder if there's a picture of Happy Watson. Hmm. Grater's. Some MFRC board members expressed disappointment concerning the reluctance of the police to involve themselves in cases of restaurant discrimination, but others accepted it and took the position that the problem more appropriately came within the jurisdiction of the MFRC than the police. Marshall Bragdon suggested that Claude Quarter an MFRC executive board member and the superintendent of the Cincinnati Public Schools should be empowered to appoint a small committee to monitor the situation, but no formal action was taken. Footnote. The unwillingness of the MFRC and police to take decisive action made Walker feel like he was fighting a losing battle. But he continued to pressure the MFRC. On December 20th, 1945, he requested that the committee hold a conference with representatives of the Citizens Committee for Human Rights, the NAACP, and the Division of Negro Welfare to discuss the next stage of the current restaurant visiting campaign by Negroes and to foster the most peaceful possible solution of the fractions of difficulties, in, of difficulties incident to the visitation. This caused a stir among MFRC board members, several of whom emphasized that our committee must not take sides in the controversy, nor even appear to, that our effectiveness lay in consultation with all parties concerned. With its position established, the executive board passed a motion authorizing Marshall Bragdon to meet with the aforementioned organizations as an impartial conciliator and to confer with the restaurant managers as well. Though neither the board minutes nor reports indicate what resulted from these meetings, the stance of the MFRC on restaurant discrimination said much about its workings. By stressing that its role was limited to impartial mediation, 
The MFRC reaffirmed its function as a committee formed to promote tolerance among various groups, which, as conceived by its creators and members, prohibited it from advocating the rights of blacks as a separate group. The same views characterize the attempts of the MFRC to deal with employment discrimination. Of all the issues that needed attention in 1944, the MFRC put top priority on adequate and continuing employment, which it considered the most effective insurance for improving relations among races, among religious groups, and between labor and management. Given this view, in April 1944, the executive board requested that John Baker, chairman of the MFRC, Industrial Relations Committee, and director of the War Manpower Commission in Cincinnati, begin studying post-war employment prospects and problems with special emphasis on job opportunities for blacks and women. On August 23, 1945, Baker reported that since V.J. Day, reconversion employment had begun and that some firms were hiring more blacks than they had during the war. Thus, he found the employment picture in Cincinnati to be much brighter than anticipated. This, however, seemed to hold true for men only because Baker expected unemployment to rise among both black and white women. Although Baker saw reason for optimism, at least with respect to job prospects for black men, racial, racially discriminatory hiring practices remained a problem in Cincinnati. In March 1945, the federal fair Employment Practices Committee, or the FEPC, held hearings on discrimination cases against the Crosley Corporation, the F.H. Lawson Company, the Baldwin Company, the Straitman Biscuit Company, the Victor Electric Products, and Victor Electric Products. During the hearings, Spokespersons for the companies defended their practices by claiming that white employees would walk off the job if forced to work with blacks. Footnote. This was not an uninformed, con unfounded concern. In June 1944, about 15,000 white workers at the Wright Aeronautical Corporation had gone on strike when the company attempted to integrate its machine shop. Footnote. Other so-called hate strikes occurred in 1945 at Delco Products and the Lunkenheimer Company. To deal with such problems, in May 1945, the MFRC pledged to seek the cooperation of the War Manpower Commission and the FEPC in anticipating conditions situations of racial tension by determining an, an, in advance what plants contemplate adopting policies to complete utilization of manpower. That is integration. Thanks. Upon identifying such companies, the MFRC planned to offer management and labor unions its quote-unquote services which consisted of providing, quote, educational materials, speakers, and other mediums to prepare, end quote, for integration, footnote. The MFRC also began meeting with companies that had initiated integration programs in order to collect information that might prove useful in convincing other companies to do the same. The MFRC conferred with Stacy Brothers Gas Construction Company, Cambridge Tile Manufacturing, Shable Manufacturing, and Pressler's Cafeteria, each of which began hiring blacks either because of a manpower shortage 
or at the insistence of the FEPC. These companies claim that while white workers at first voiced opposition, integration resulted in no particular difficulty. In addition, the MFRC met with Cincinnati milling machine officials who said their company hired blacks as a matter of policy but limited Negro employees to definite jobs, to definite job categories, and restricted upgrading. When approaching companies about black employment, the MFRC, in accordance with its desire to minimize any tensions associated with racial issues, favored gradualism and discretion. In large measure, the committee placed its hopes for increasing the quality of Negro employment on meetings between local employers and Homer Lucan, an MFRC executive board member and vice president of the integrated Lukenheimer Company. Lucan seemed to seemed the appropriate person to undertake such a mission because those he met knew they would not be put on the spot. Lucan believed that employers who feared trouble from their employees should not be pushed along too quickly. Thus, a gradual give and take characterized his meetings. By April 1947, approximately six months after Lucan began conferring with businessmen, he had achieved heartening progress, though on a small scale. While the MFRC approached employment problems with caution and apparently met with little success, some black Cincinnatians adopted a more aggressive style. In 1946, the West End Civic League, a Negro job-seeking group, began approaching the white owners of businesses in the predominantly black West End in hopes of persuading them to hire black workers. The members of the West End Civic League used diplomacy first, but if that failed, they resorted to picketing and distributing handbills outside those businesses that practiced discrimination. After having been subjected to such tactics, the owners of Stein Department Store and Laurel Cleaners called on the MFRC for help. Marshall Bragdon responded by bringing the disputing parties together for negotiations. Bragdon, however, did not particularly liked the role he played in these meetings because he felt it put the MFRC in the middle of a crossfire. He also disliked the pressure tactics of the West End Civic League. Nonetheless, he recognized black employment needs and considered it the duty of the MFRC to serve as an impartial yet sympathetic channel. The negotiations achieved some success. Both owners agreed to hire one black worker. Considering Bragdon's discomfort with his role, he was relieved that neither the West End Civic League nor the businessmen accused the MFRC of unfairness. That same year, the West End Civic League also pressured the Central Five Cents to One Dollar Store into hiring four blacks which prompted all the white saleswomen to quit. To Bragdon, this substantiated his judgment about West End Civic League tactics. He felt that if the developments had not come so fast, we and other parties interested in the situation might have averted this exodus. The MFRC viewed its meetings with businessmen to discuss discriminatory hiring practices as an educational endeavor. The MFRC hoped to persuade people to change their behavior by changing their attitudes through education. While virtually every activity of the committee contained an educational element, it also sponsored a variety of programs and events designed solely for that purpose. In September 1944, for example, the MFRC sponsored its first Friendly Relations Week, which became an annual event. 
During friendly, friendly Relations Week, the MFRC solicited the organizations represented on the committee and all racial and religious groups to participate in programs designed to promote the virtues of tolerance. Friendly Relations Week illustrated two points about MFRC educational programs. They were targeted to reach a broad spectrum of the population and intended to reduce tension between different groups. When Theodore M. Barry requested in August 1944 that the committee sponsor a race relations institute, the executive board thought that such an institute should not be confined to racial discussions. The MFRC attempted to resolve this matter by including in its Friendly Relations Week program an institute on propaganda, housing, and jobs to address the problems faced by blacks. The same kind of issue surfaced again during preparations for Friendly Relations Week in 1946. The MFRC Publicly Publicity Committee proposed to promote the event using the slogan, Let's Be Friendly, accompanied by a photograph of a black hand and a white hand clasped together. This set off a debate because, in Marshall Bragdon's opinion, such a photo would give the erroneous impression that the Friendly Relations Committee is preoccupied solely with the Negro-white problem. The committee finally decided to hold a photo contest and leave it to the photographers to seek pictorial instances of understanding. In 1948, the MFRC was the local sponsor of the Freedom Train a privately funded event initiated by U.S. Attorney General Tom C. Clark, who thought it would be a good idea to send some of the most famous documents in American history across the country by train and allow the public to view them as a means of promote, promoting better citizenship. The Freedom Train stopped in Cincinnati August 6th through 7th, and an estimated 10,000 people turned out on the first day. While busy preparing for the Freedom Train during the summer of 1948, the MFRC also engaged in a budget dispute with the City Council. The disagreement developed after the Council Finance Committee refused to grant a supplement to the 1948 MFRC budget to pay proposed cost of living increases for the staff. Councilman Charles P. Taft suggested that the MFRC search for outside funding if it insisted on raising salaries. This did not please most of the executive board members, who thought that the city should pay adequate salaries if it recognized the need for MFRC. They also voiced the concern that dependence on outside funds might bias the operation of the committee. After some wrangling back and forth, the council agreed to the budget supplement in October, but it also proposed to alter the relationship between the city and the MFRC. The committee had existed as an arm of the city government and received its funds out of the mayor's budget. The council wanted to change all this by paying the MFRC $15,000 in a lump sum to perform certain specific services for the city on a contract basis. Some executive board members expressed reservations about this plan because they considered it crucial that the committee retain its identification with the city so as not to undermine its official status. Despite such worries, the new setup was established in January 1949. Marshall Bragdon assured those concerned about the committee's official status that it was still the mayor's committee. The mayor would continue to appoint members, and there would be little overt change so far as the general public is concerned. As part of the new agreement, the MFRC incorporated as a not-for-profit organization on January 11, 1949. Incorporation and the new relationship to the city, however, did not change the functions of the MFRC or its approach to solving problems. 
The committee continued in its preference for working behind the scenes and chose not to take any stand that in the view of the members might be interpreted as showing partiality toward blacks as a group or lead to confrontations that might increase racial tension. And of course, the general problems remained the same, prejudice and discrimination against blacks. The efforts of the MFRC to combat racial prejudice and discrimination bore the marks of the basic ideas from which the committee sprung. The tendency to view society as divided into different groups resulted in the creation of a committee designed to hear the complaints of all groups, but not to take sides in disputes between them. Thus, the MFRC would not take an advocacy role for the rights of blacks or any other single racial, religious, or ethnic group. In essence, the committee intended to treat all groups equally. Treating all groups equally, however, implied that they were in fact equal. Yet, most of the problems addressed by the MFRC could be attributed to the unequal social status of blacks. During its early years, the MFRC never seemed to recognize this contradiction between the assumptions under which it operated and social reality. But it must be remembered that the primary purpose of the MFRC was to reduce tension between groups in hopes of preventing violent upheaval. This function required that the committee work toward ending prejudice and discrimination but it also dictated the approach to such work. The fear of taking any action that might increase tension resulted in the adoption of a cautious and gradualistic approach, which limited the role the MFRC would play. To expect the MFRC on the similar committees that were formed in other cities during the 1940s to take the kind of militant action advocated in the 1960s is to ignore the notion that prevailed in the United States during the second quarter of the 20th century. The pluralistic mode of thought rested on the pre premise that cultural group affiliation determined the character of individuals, a premise that posited the group as the basic unit of social concern and one that, sup that supported a separate but equal doctrine in social relations. The MFRC did not challenge the conventional wisdom but rather reflected it. In a period that tended to view society as pluralistic, the central problem became how to get the diverse groups that comprised the city to cooperate in the interest of securing the welfare of the city as a whole. This depended, among other things, upon the maintenance of some measure of toleration for racial, religious, and ethnic diversity and the prevention of intergroup conflict. Not until the emergence of the 1950s of a new mode of thought, one that placed primacy on the autonomous individual rather than the group, did the notion of cultural group determinism come under serious attack for inhibiting autonomous individuals in their pursuit of self-advancement and self-fulfillment. So that's the end of Chapter 10 by Robert A. Burnham, The Mayor's Friendly Relations Committee, MFRC, MFRC. And as with all of these chapters, all of these essays, there are pages and pages of footnotes where you can find the original source of the information used to write the essay. That is powerful because you know that the information is authoritative, that it's true, and the information in the essay is true. All of the essays are filled with footnotes, quotations, and uh, reference to resources from which they got the information. So needless to say, this is indeed a powerful book. And uh, I'd like to share with you that I have uh, friended um, 
Henry Lewis Taylor Jr., the editor of this book. He has responded and, and thanked me for doing this work uh, in all humility. And uh, I am hoping that I can get him to come to Cincinnati. I am also uh, encouraging high school English teachers, social studies, and history teachers to have their students read or listen to me read this book. And um, my hope is um, at the culmination of the reading of the book by the students that we can have Mr. Taylor to come and speak to the, the students who have engaged. And at the very least, I would hope that we can probably, uh, possibly, uh, um, what is that called, stream, stream him in to the classrooms uh, in, um, in real time and uh, allow the students to ask questions. So please read or listen to the reading of this book and formulate questions that you might have about what you're hearing. I am excited and really uh, looking forward to finding images of some of the people named here in this particular chapter. There is only one chapter remaining. That's chapter 11. Yes, chapter 11. So uh, I hope to get that read possibly tomorrow and upload it. And, um, and I hope that you will enjoy it. Thank you so much for listening. God bless. Bye-bye.